What's up, everybody? We hope you had a good Thanksgiving if you celebrate. If not, I hope you had a lot of time off work where you got to do nothing. That's always the best time. Oh, yeah. I love, I'm at the ripe old age where I get tired from doing nothing. <laughs> I'm of the same age, but I, I just enjoy doing nothing. It doesn't make me tired. If I can stay up all night doing nothing, I'm going to stay up all fucking night doing nothing. Oh man, I can't do it anymore. Yeah, I'm just I'm I'm wired to be nocturnal. I fucking hate the day job life. Would you prefer like an overnight job? Um no, just because that would affect my relationships with everybody I know. Right, yeah. Um, yeah. I had a friend who worked overnights when we were in our early twenties and I barely ever saw him at all. And I feel like that's kind of the way it goes if if you're working overnight because then you're sleeping during the main hours of the day and then people get home from work and then they don't really want to hang out immediately after work. And then, you know, then you're getting ready for work. And so who are you going to hang out with? Yeah. I've had a few friends work overnight and that's, that's exactly what happened. You just don't see them anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And, and with kids, like it's especially shitty. So I, it's nothing I would want to deal with. We commend those who do. Yeah. Like, if I didn't have to work a day job, like, if I could work, like, I don't know, say, podcasting for a living, then I could, it would be super easy, because I could do bullshit through, you know, basically, like, the, the middle of the night, go to bed, and then I'm I'm up by the time kids are home from school or done with work or whatever, and, and good to go. Yeah, yeah. But that's not the reality of the world, so... You gotta work a stupid day job and work stupid day job hours doing stupid day job things. Yes, sir. Well, tonight we're gonna talk about one of the uh, areas of cryptozoology, I would say, maybe even mythology, that I wish was real almost more than anything else. Oh, so so we're not talking about bullshit day jobs? <laughs> I thought that was a, <laughs> shit. Okay. I th Paranormal events that bullshit day jobs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's what this show will be. <laughs> I saw a dinosaur in the bathroom. <laughs> well, funny enough, that's what we're going to talk about. I don't know if it's, we're going to call it Living Dinosaurs episode, episode three or what, but uh, I came across an article, a couple videos that listed off some supposed living dinosaurs that I've never heard of. So I thought it'd be fun to share them on here with you guys. Yeah, well, that's always, always a fun topic. I love dinosaurs. I've been a huge dinosaur nerd since I was a little kid and it and it never went away. So I'm pumped. I, I want to live in a world where dinosaurs are still creeping around somewhere. Yeah. As unlikely as it is, I, I am all for a, a living dinosaur being somewhere, be it Nessie, be it a, a Baba Fowey, be it any type of <laughs> ancient living creature. I was watching something about dinosaurs with my daughter the other day, and it, it just showed some dinosaur roar and attack something. And she's, you know, older now, and she looks at me, and she's like, Jesus, you know, fucking Christ. I was like, yeah. I was like, you know, that's one of the cool things about being obsessed with dinosaurs when we were kids. Like, my generation is, when you get a little bit older, you look back, and for me, there's no questions if our planet's been home to monsters before. If you, you know, like if you look at when the term dinosaur was coined, I mean, before that, they were just fucking monsters to people. And they, I mean, those things existed on Earth. I mean, I don't even <laughs> understand why in creation, uh, religion or anything, why God would make giant monsters and be like, no, 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 no. Okay, we'll do people instead. Well, that's that's why evolution is a thing because because it, that it. it if only, if only we lived in a world where where Jesus rode on a velociraptor, that would be a fucking amazing. But yeah, that's but definitely with the evolution stuff. But even even with evolution, like what a isn't that kind of strange that the natural species of this planet was giant fucking monsters? Well, it was due to the the nitrogen levels in the atmosphere, and and it was that 
it was a time where everything was big. There were larger insects. The only thing that wasn't big were the mammals. Any mammals that were kicking around that time were the fucking little mouse things. We we had to wait for those giant fuckers to die off before we had a shot. You bastards. <laughs> You're holding us back. <laughs> the comet was the best thing that ever happened. <laughs> Fuck you guys. And now we eat chickens, which are the closest relative to dinosaurs. So who's <laughs> the king now? <laughs> Oh, man. Well, one of the places that's home to many uh, living dinosaurs is the Congo. And holy shit, is there some strange tales that come out of the mighty Congo. We got Mokele Mbembe, the Titan Boa, and even stranger for the most part. Doesn't it seem like uh, most of the cryptids, if not all of them, uh, seem to be dinosaurs? No, they also have giant spiders. Yeah, giant spiders too, but I'm sure those exist. Yeah. That's like a prehistoric <laughs> creature, right? I don't know. I don't think a, a spider of that size ever really existed. But that being said, um, because of the their body structure, it would be very unlikely we would we would really have any knowledge of them because they have an exoskeleton and they would have you know rotted away unless they got like embedded perfectly in in like some sort of mineral that would preserve them. But um, right, right. I I I don't think because. Yeah, I, I don't think we we would know if they exist that big. But to our knowledge, spiders have not have not grown to be big enough to hunt humans. But how fucking terrifying is that as a prospect? Yeah, that's gnarly. Yeah, that's that's probably the scariest cryptid there is. You no know, shit. I mean, even reading about Percy Fawcett's writings about how big the spiders were in the Amazon. That's yeah. Fuck that. And those were dog size, weren't they, in the Amazon? Yeah, and they were able to catch dogs and shit. <laughs> Fuck. Oh, God. Even a dog-sized spider. Fuck out. Even a cat-sized spider. Yeah. Fuck off. I'm not going to punt that. No. So what does it mean to you when a lot of the sightings, legends, and stories that come from people who you know, had no fucking idea what a dinosaur is, and in many of these cases, that's exactly what they describe. Walking into this, the only way you can with, like, of course there's not dinosaurs. But I, I always go. Well, I, I'm not going to walk in with, of course, there's not dinosaurs ever. I want to walk in there with, of course, there might be dinosaurs. That's that's the that's where I want my head to be at. OK, good, because that's the you're... I refuse to shit on, on dinosaurs due to, to lack of evidence. Do you think that's a like low hanging fruit for Nessie deniers? Maybe. Yeah. But. We don't want to talk about Nessie here. Nessie has no place among talk about real dinosaurs, <laughs> damn it. Uh, I'm always reminded of that Monster Quest episode when they went to go look for, uh, I think they went to go look for Mokele and Bembe. Do you remember that episode? I don't think so. It was fascinating. They did a little ex experiment that I, it was just mind-blowing for me at the time. They brought out a bunch of pictures of animals. Uh, and they had mixed pictures of animals that were in the region of the Congo. They mixed in animals that were from like North America. And then they've started putting in pictures of different dinosaurs. And it was amazing to watch these, uh, like the tribesmen look through the pictures and, you know, like they would be shown a picture and they'd be like, oh yeah, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, turn the page like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they'd get to like a, a fucking bald eagle or some shit like that. And they'd be like, I don't know what type of bird that is i don't know what that is and they'd go back to an alligator and they'd go yeah we know what that is and they'd show a brontosaurus and be like yeah we know what that is and it, it was just amazing to see them fly over these dinosaurs like it's something that they've lived with their whole life me being younger saying you know there couldn't be dinosaurs anymore that was just a wild thing to see i feel like every time we talk about dinosaurs we always talk about that VHS tape that we both had in the 80s <laughs> with a guy who turns into a dinosaur at the end. But that was where I first heard about Mokili and Bembe. And to me, the fact that it was on that tape was proof that, that there were still dinosaurs alive. <laughs> I was like, no, those are fucking very clearly natives hunting a dinosaur. I need to, I, I found that on YouTube actually, dude. Yeah, I did as well. I also, did you ever see the Fred Savage one? I think so. Where he has to write a report and he doesn't know what he's going to write about. And then he decides he's going to write about dinosaurs and he has a dream that's a, a cartoon dinosaur music video. 
holy shit, maybe I didn't see that. It's so awesome. That's on YouTube as well. How did you how did you find the one that we both had when we were kids? I had it I had I finally had to resort to man turns into dinosaur. You you were the one that sent it to me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was so, so excited when you sent it to me. So excited. Like it was like reliving my childhood again. Yeah, man, that was great. I re- I watched that thing every day. I did too. That and the Fred Savage one. Those just constantly watch those. All right. Well, the first one we're going to cover tonight is called the Cassi Rex. That's right. Get the fuck out of here, Brontosaurus and Super Snake. There's supposedly a, we have ter- a Rex. <laughs> There's a Rex running around in the Congo. Shit. Uh, as its name tells, this beast has been seen in the Kasai region of the Congo, and supposedly more than once. First seen by big shot Swedish hunter John Johnson in 1932. The story goes that... Says he's so fucking fancy, he's got to repeat his name. Yeah. John Johnson. I, I read that it was, his name was Jan Johansson. You know, just it's just the... Um, Jan Johnson. <laughs> Fuck, hold on. I got to pop up. On my computer. Get out of here, Dell. Go fuck yourself. Fuck, fuck out of <laughs> here. Uh, but he was uh, itching to shoot some elephants. Classy. Yeah. Uh, so he and his manservant sent out from their camp to Cape Town, or from Cape Town, to find some elephants. And they trekked through a swamp to a place in the savannah called the Kasai Valley. When- this way, Argyle. <laughs> Steady the umbrella, sir. <laughs> When they got there, they noticed that the air the area was absolutely desolate. There were no animals of any kind anywhere. So they moped uh, around for a while, finding nothing. And just as they were about to head back to camp, the servant cried out to Johnson, Elephants! And they dismounted, and Johnson took aim at a pair of elephants and a younger elephant. They were about 44 meters away. He found this strange because elephants usually traveled in packs. There should have been more elephants, not just this, these three elephants there. But just as that thought ended, he noticed something in the brush near the elephants move. And he noticed that it was really fucking big. And with his experience, he deduced that whatever it was was stalking these elephants. And it was about to attack them. And just then it did. It jumped from the bushes and started attacking the elephants. And uh, the so the servant dove to the ground and basically just hid there. He didn't even want to see what was going on. But Johnson shot three times, hitting the creature once in the back. Uh, he said that the creature slowly backed away and left. And I guess they had their fair share of fun for that day because they immediately headed back to their camp. And on their way back to their camp, they had to head back through that swamp where they suddenly came across the same creature. This time they saw it devouring a rhinoceros, and it was only about 22 meters away. The servant ran, and Johnson watched him run towards camp with his gun. So he turned back to look at the creature and remembered that he had a camera. So he took a photo of the beast and slowly crept his way out of there, trying to be as quiet as he could, and went back to camp. And yes, there is a photograph of this creature. How how believable is this photograph? Now, see, this is something that is weird about this case. I I think this is maybe a story that turned into something that uh, people use to maybe politicize the region or get tourism to the region because there's three photos that exist, actually. And some of them are as bad as them cutting out a picture of a lizard and taping it to a photograph of a jungle and photocopying it. So I don't know what's the real photo. (laughs) But there's one that looked really cool. But then doing some research, I found that it it was manipulated. There's an actual statue of a T-Rex that they used in the image, and they superimposed them over each other, and it's the exact same thing. Where where do you want me to send these photos, Mike? Because I want you to look at these. You can text them over. I'm going to do that right now. But it's I think after looking at the photos, there may have been photos at one point. But it seems like somebody's petru- perpetuated the story by making fake photos, maybe to keep the story going. Who knows? But the one with the statue, Mike, I understand it to be Johnson's photo. Not a single one of these is real. Yeah, I don't think so either. So 
I don't understand. I, I, what do you think about there supposedly being a photo of this thing and then th- three different photos existing with all of them being fake? I would say that's par for the course. That's what I would say. Right. Yeah. That's it's just weird. Like that one with that monitor lizard. They literally just fucking glued a picture on there. Yeah. I don't. Hey, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then like. It looks like like someone had had drawn on the film. Yeah. Oh man, it's a it's like a I don't know. I I just we 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 talked a, a few times about why people would want a cryptid to be in their area, but I don't know. This is <laughs> these are bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't think there's anything real about these pictures. And I mean, honestly, the story it sounds like those wacky stories from from the 1800s in in the west right like it kind of has that sort of feel to it it does and it was actually the encounter was published in the rhodesia herald along with i don't know what picture but supposedly the picture now i emailed you a, a quote from this article mike would you mind reading that on february 16th last i went on a shooting trip accompanied by my gun bearer I had only a Winchester for small game, not expecting anything big. At 2 p.m. I had reached the Kasai Valley. No game was in sight. As we were going down to the water, the boy suddenly called out, Elephants! It appeared that two giant bulls were almost hidden by the jungle. About 50 yards away from them I saw something incredible. A monster about 16 yards in length, with a lizard's head and tail. I closed my eyes and reopened them. There could be no doubt about it. This animal was still there. My boy cowered in the grass, whimpering. I was shaken by the hunting fever. My teeth rattled with fear. Three times I snapped. Only one attempt came out well. Suddenly, the monster vanished with a remarkably rapid movement. It took me some time to recover. Alongside me, the boy prayed and cried. I lifted him up, pushed him along, and made him follow me home. On the way, we had to traverse a big swamp. Progress was slow, for my limbs were still half paralyzed with fear. There in the swamp, the huge lizard appeared once more, tearing lumps from a dead rhino. It was covered in ooze. I was only about 25 yards away. It was simply terrifying. The boy had taken French leave, carrying the rifle with him. (laughs) Sorry. At first, I was careful not to stir. Then I thought of my camera. I could hear the crunching of the rhino bones in the lizard's mouth. Just as I clicked, it jumped into deep water. The experience was too much for my nervous system. Completely exhausted, I sank down behind the bush that had given me shelter. The animal's phenomenally rapid movement was the most awe-inspiring thing I have ever seen. I must have looked like one demented when at last I regained camp. Metcalf, who was the boss there, said I approached him, waving the camera about in a silly way and emitting unintelligible sounds. I dare say I did. For eight days I lay in a fever, unconscious nearly all the time. So that's the account from Johnson in his own words. Sounds a a, a bit dramatic to me. Even for the time and being a, a fancy Swedish hunter? I don't know. It, it's It's written like he's telling a story. Rather than reporting right, true it, events, it sure does, huh? Yeah, Especially I mean, with... I enjoy it for what it is, but I don't think it's for real, and it makes me sad to say it. That's okay. There's still hope. That wasn't the last sighting of the, of the Kasai Rex. Oh shit! Okay, let's let's get back into it. You got me. A year later, in 1933, a group of five hunters headed to the Congo, intent on finding this living T Rex. They had seen the article in the paper and and figured some European dude shit their pants when he saw a crocodile. But nonetheless, a croc that size would fetch a pretty penny. So away they went to Kasai Valley to find Johnson's fucking giant lizard monster. And everything was fine, just crossing the same swamp till one of the hunters saw what he thought was a reddish anaconda submerge itself in the water. Then they were suddenly hit with a huge wave on their left side. What they now realized was a giant tail had swung out of the water, and it actually knocked one of the men into the water. The men who remained on their feet started to unload their weapons at what they called a reddish mass that simply swam away. 
The man who fell into the water had suffered a broken arm, so he was struggling to get back onto solid ground, but he did so in a hurry. As soon as he did, they all heard what they called a huge growling sound come from under the water. Upon hearing this, the wounded man made a break for it, trying to regroup with his pals, but his path was cut off when the wrecks exploded out of the water, landing between the man and his friends. Uh, it stood there for a second, roared, and dove back into the water, and he took that opportunity to get the fuck out of there. Interesting. So, hmm. what, if, what if it's not the same thing? What if it's just like a, a coincidence? I mean, if we're talking about the Congo, I wouldn't doubt that. <laughs> They've got a lot of weird stuff coming out of there. And it, again, mostly dinosaurs. Yes. It's the land of the dinosaurs, man. Fucking land of the lost. Yeah. Third sighting. There, there, there's more. Supposedly, this one, uh, this one get, it gets credit for. There's another story that is attributed to the Rex. Robert Henderson was a zoologist and, by all accounts, a well-known hunter. He had planned on taking a trip to the Congo to hunt and explore. He was a zoologist, so he was there to like find new species. He was sure he was going to find new species in the Congo. And uh, he was delayed uh, to take this trip by a year as his wife had passed away. But uh, this year trip let him plan it a little bit better, and he ended up just settling in a town of Mutombo La Mata, where the local people grew to like the guy. They grew really fond of him. So when it came time to go for his trip, he set out to the Kasai Valley with 10 locals as guides and aides. After six days, there was no sign of the party. There was no sign of them returning, and the people decided to give it a few more days. And as it had rained... They figured that they were slowed down by the swelling of the lakes and the swamp uh, along their route back home. After three more days, ten more locals and five members of the military set out to find them. What they found is, is a campsite that was abandoned by the party. And about ten meters away, they found what they can only describe as a massacre. There were it, literally limbs everywhere, crushed heads. It was supposed to be pretty, pretty rough. That sounds like a, a leftover from a Bigfoot attack. Yeah, a, a pissed off, what do, we, what do we call it, rabbit or rogue Bigfoots? <laughs> yeah, rogue. In my mind, Bigfoot can't get rabies. Yeah, me neither. He just it, he's, he's above that shit. He could just like eat the right combination of leaves and it would be gone. He can cure anything yeah. with what's in the He'll foot. shit out rabies, he doesn't care. Yeah. Fucking Bigfoot. Dude, you know what I learned about uh, armadillos carrying, uh, was it leprosy? leprosy? Yeah, it's only a certain kind, and the only way you might be able to get it is if you cut it open and eat its liver raw. Only yeah. its liver. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh. And even then, you've only got like a 10% chance or something. Right, yeah, so I can play with any armadillo I come across. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm dude. gonna. Yeah, you could do whatever you want with it. You could wear it as a hat, get two of them and make armadillo shoes. <laughs> Let him live in my beard. Yeah. Get four of them, strap them to your car, and you don't even need tires. Just roll them up in a ball and <laughs> away you go. So let's say that we live in a world that's like Monster Island, right? Like there's this island somewhere and there's like all these dinosaurs and, and crazy monsters and shit. And uh, let's say instead of an island, it's the Congo. But but let's what if there's like still rogue agents that that like Godzilla is is a rogue agent. He doesn't he doesn't live on Monster Island. He's like fuck that man. The oceans is mine, and he takes the ocean. But what if what if there's another monster forgotten by time that makes no sense, but it's still there, waiting, watching in the ocean. Yeah. Oh shit. Yeah. This is not a dinosaur. So. Right now, just by me talking about this, we cannot call the show Living Dinosaurs because what I'm about to talk about is not a fucking dinosaur. Maybe, maybe. It might be a, a creature from the dinosaur time period. But not a dinosaur. <laughs> not a lizard or a yes. reptilian. No, no. So this thing, it's it's known as the Conreet. And what what that name means, it's... Vietnamese, which actually means millipede, but this this thing is basically a, a millipede monster that lives in 
the ocean. <laughs> it's that's really like the best way to describe it. There's some uh, cases that took place in the past that I'm going to talk about, but to to start off, I I want to talk about the most well known, well publicized one, which was a sighting from 1921 by 18 year old young man named Tran Van Khan. And he saw the washed up remains on the beach and reported it to Dr. Krempf, who was the director of Indochina's Oceanographic and Fishery Service at, at that time period. Um, so he called him, told him about the remains, and I've got a quote from him. Uh, he says, It was a carcass in a very advanced state of putrefaction. The head had gone. The body alone was 60 feet long by 3 feet wide. The animal was formed of successive segments, almost all alike one another. Each segment was 2 feet long and 3 feet wide and had a pair of appendages 2 feet, uh, two feet 4 inches long. The segments were of a remarkable consistency and rang like sheet metal when hit with a stick. The color of this envelope was dark brown on the dorsal surface and light yellow on the ventral surface. The stench that arose from this prodigious animal was such that even the animites would not go near it, and it was decided to tow the remains out to sea and sink them. Damn. So when I first heard about this, I thought that it might, just, just based on the, the initial description that it looked like a millipede, I thought maybe it might be something like the, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this. So my, my Scottish and UK friends, please forgive me, but I, I think it's the Hebrides blob. Um, and it was an unidentified carcass that washed ashore in Scotland in 1990. But if you look at the picture, there's like a central mass and then off of it, there's what looks like segments like almost like legs or something coming off of it. I've got a description from the witness of this thing, uh, Louise Witz, or Louise Witz, not Louise, Louise Witz. A head would appear to be a head at one end, a curved back and seemed to be covered with eaten away flesh or even a furry skin and was 12 feet long and it had all these shapes like fins along its back. So did, did you find the picture? Yeah. Ugh. So based on that picture, you see what I mean, how it could be, you know, mistaken for like a millipede type of thing. Right, right. Totally. But they they did do DNA analysis on this and it was the uh, decomposed remains of a sperm whale. Wow. What part is that? It's probably the muscles along the back. Wow. Yeah. But with what he says about the shell or whatever you want to call it ringing when he hit it with a stick like like he was hitting metal that's that's pretty interesting yeah could that be uh i mean could it be actually made of metal or uh, was it shell of a density that would actually give off that type of sound well if i was giorgio sukalos i would say that this was some sort of uso that the extraterrestrials were using to traverse the oceans of the earth but since I'm not Giorgio Sucolos, <laughs> I'm going to say that it was probably some sort of exoskeleton. But that's, I, I don't know what else to make of it, you know, based on that description. Right. And just looking at this, this blob picture that you're talking right. about. Yep. I, I mean, like, uh, what else are they going to fucking say? Like, wh what do you think of when they, they say shit like that? Oh, it's like, oh, we tested it. It's a sperm whale carcass. That that doesn't look like any part of a sperm whale to me. I'm not a fucking whale well, expert, but I, get, I mean, I know. But you gotta you gotta think like when a whale dies in the ocean, it's it's being like so many things are eating that thing. As oh it's yeah, decomposing. it's getting brined in salt flying. water. <laughs> yeah, you got birds flying in. You've got sharks ripping chunks off. You've got fish taking smaller chunks. You know. And and it's basically a floating buffet for, for days. And then the remains just kind of wash up. It's probably blubber and connective tissue and maybe some muscle from the back. That would be my guess. And, and it's because of the way that it's kind of been eaten away and 
left to get baked by the sun and and get salt all in it it probably started to fall apart and that's what we're left with but it does i mean the picture does make it look like it's kind of symmetrical so you're like kind of like well that's that's symmetrical what the how's that work yeah i don't know i also read a description of the convict where uh, its millipede legs were actually fl- flipper like appendages and that's what i'm almost seeing that yeah. in this photo <laughs> yeah right so I I don't know, but that thing looks squishy, and I don't think if you were to hit it that it would ring like like it was sheet metal. Yeah, good point. Good point. Yeah, but this uh, millipede monster thing, um, or well, the description is something. It not only was it sighted quite a few times in the eighteen hundreds, it's also. Uh, a part of Vietnamese mythology. Oh and shit! I was not aware of that. So in in uh, there's a bay called Halong Bay, and if you look up pictures of it, you're gonna see all these weird rock formations rising out of the ocean. And in Vietnamese mythology, um, there's a, a specific. Uh, I, I think it's the the Chich Quai. Uh, which is a, a collection of Vietnamese folklore. The this thing was called a sea dragon of many feet, and it was known to be a creature that would attack fishing boats and eat the sailors that would fall in from the destroyed boats. But the second king of Vietnam came in, um, and he ended up defeating this thing in battle and cutting it up into several pieces which the pieces then went on to form these odd rock formations. And that's that's kind of that's something that's mirrored in other cultures too, like the the story of Tiamat being used to create the world. Mm-hmm. The world's Tiamat was the world serpent. This was a a a creature in the ocean. But um we we got into all that Tiamat stuff a few episodes back, so I don't wanna retread that ground but um you know it's it's just where you see similarities in in mythology but like i mentioned not only was this thing in mythology th- there were several sightings in the late 18 to early 1900s um with the most recent before that carcass washed up being 1915 and the reports came they were all in halong bay Um, and there were eight sightings altogether between 1893 and 1815. And it wasn't just seen by sailors on board. It was also officers and merchants that were part of the crew as well. And, um, there were, let me see, there were eight different ships. Um, I'm not going to attempt some of these because I will absolutely I can't do French I just I my, I can't wrap my head around it so most of these are French names but there's one called the Hanoi there's one called the Heron one called the Charles Hordouin and the rest are all French names that I will absolutely butcher so rather than attempt it and butcher it I'll just say they were they were vessels with they were merchant vessels that were in the Halong Bay. But there was one ship in particular, a ship called the Avalanche, which had three separate sightings of two different millipede monsters that they had seen swimming together near an archipelago. And they spotted this pair on three separate occasions. Damn. So if there's a pair of them, then you'd have to think that there would be, you know, that's probably a breeding pair, maybe. Mm-hmm. But the fact that this was seen by multiple members of eight, well, I guess nine different crews, if we include the avalanche, between 1893 and 1915, that's that's pretty incredible. And then since 1915, there has not been a single sighting of a living one. 1920 was the first time the creature surfaced since, and it was dead. So were these maybe the last two? Wow, it kind of lines up. Yeah. Wow. 
Wow. And, Holy crap. And maybe the last, or maybe there was just the, maybe there were two. One of them got killed and washed up, and the other one was left alone and died of loneliness. Yeah. Just swam in the moon night every night and wept himself to death. Yeah. Poor bastard. Yeah. But I I don't know. I, I think it's it's interesting. I, I love when we have sightings of creatures that were kind of talked about in mythology and then all of a sudden they just pop back up again. Yeah, that's awesome. I didn't I all I yeah. knew is there is a of the ship naval officer sighting and uh but I didn't know it tied into their mythology and that's fantastic. Yeah, that's there's a lot of evidence for this thing existing or something like it. You know, there, I mean, yeah, there is a, like a prehistoric millipede called Anthropora and it's, it's pretty big, but not 160 feet long. Was it aquatic? No, that's my only thing. I don't, I, I wouldn't know what to look for if there was an aquatic millipede type creature or. I would imagine if there was, it would probably, rather than be a millipede, it would probably be something like related to like shrimp or something like triops right yeah something like that when they when they described it having a uh, flipper like appendages instead of legs yeah like a millipede like that that reminded me of my triops and that th- yeah. they have that same thing going on so i was like whoa okay i can picture that yeah yeah or like a horseshoe crab something something like that yeah just giant that's crazy yeah but Hasn't been seen since since the uh, dead body washed up in the in nineteen twenty what twenty one. So, I think uh, think that they are probably extinct if in fact they ever existed. Yeah, bon voyage and our due. <laughs> yeah, sorry, millipede monster serpent thing. It's it, it was a good run. We hardly knew you. And we're talking about you today, sir. Keeping you. Keep yeah, we're we're keeping the dream alive. Let's see. Maybe maybe we'll start seeing the ghost of of the Conreet. Well, the last one I want to cover is a monster called the Partridge Creek Monster. Now, this one has the same feel as the Cassi Rex, but surprisingly, there's a ton of article coverage on this thing. This is one of those stories that's been passed around and handed down and and played with. But the earliest account comes from one George Dupuy in a story he published in one of those super cool old school Freudian magazines from the late 1800s, early 1900s. This one from the 1908 issue of Stand Magazine, which published cool and weird stories, some fiction, some nonfiction. And that's where a lot of the debate in this case starts. George uh, was a writer as well as a traveler. The magazine he reported his supposed account with the creature to was probably, I mean, let's face it, for the time, some weird sci-fi like short story magazine to most people. But I, I said they did publish true stories as well. And that's how his encounter with the creature was published as a true story. Hold on one second. No problem. Be- before you get into this, is this story about a guy who saw his friends get eaten by a sea serpent while he was in the water? No. Okay. All right. Never mind. Then Continue on. I just, I heard um, a sea serpent story that was told under similar circumstances. It was told as being a true story, but it was in a magazine that also published like sci-fi and horror. So, you know. Do with that what you will, but it was about a guy who, um, him and his buddies went swimming in the ocean, I think off the coast of, of Massachusetts maybe or something, I don't know, some island off Massachusetts, and uh, they lost one of their friends, and as they were looking around, they saw this creature, and it pulled another one of their friends down, and then he was able to escape. Damn. I'll pass on that. Yeah. I I may have even told the story like early on in the show's history because cause I remember it like the way that it was told it really creeped me out but just like thinking about it like the the way that he described it like it started to rain and it was a gray cloudy day and just scary as all hell but it's probably fake but it's still a scary story to me damn it. <laughs> It's like rule of thumb for like most creepy pasta, right? Like th- I swear to God, this is true. This is a true story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But this was this was creepy pasta before the internet. 
Right, right. This was creepy pasta and pulp magazines. <laughs> well, to clear up any doubt, Dupuy clearly stating in his story, the story that follows is in no sense a romance. I wish in the first place to ask the readers of the following narrative to believe that I am in no way attempting to oppose on their credulity. Concerning the amazing spectacle I am about to describe, I report nothing but plain facts, however outstanding and apparently incredible they may seem at first glance. That's, that's what he's starting his article with. So the story goes that one of his favorite places to chill was this place in the Yukon called the Nequestian Post. He had a friend that lived there, Father Pierre Lanou. He had a cabin out there, and he would often visit him and stay at his cabin while he tended to his uh, church stuff. And one day while sitting on the father's porch, he heard someone whistle for him. And he looked up, and it was coming uh, from the river. And he looked up and saw one of his good buddies, a dude named James Butler. And Dupuy greeted, greeted his old friend and was asked how his luck with prospecting was going. The, a lot of these guys... Uh, James Butler was actually a, I believe he was like a businessman from San Francisco. But at this time, a lot of people were giving up that shit and chasing gold in the Yukon. But Butler had told Dupuy that two days earlier, while trying to cross the river, he came across a cabin that belonged to a man named Grant. The men noticed each other, and as the weather had turned bad for the evening, Grant offered Butler to stay in, in the cabin. And he was actually going to go on a moose hut with two, with two of his friends in the next morning. And he said he was welcome to come along. And Butler agreed. And the next morning, they had headed out uh, to an area called Partridge Lake. And the area was full of uh, natural salt formations, which the moose and the deer in the area loved to lick about. And when they got there, sure enough, they spotted two big moose and a juvenile in the distance. They took aim, but before anyone could get, anyone could get a shot off, the younger moose let out a horrible scream and dashed off into some nearby brush, soon followed by his other moose homeboys. They decided to approach the area where the moose had been scared away, and Butler told Dupuy, arriving at the moose lick, a spot about 60 feet long and 15 feet wide, we saw in the mud, and almost on the level of the water of the lick, the fresh imprint of the body of a monstrous animal. Its belly had made impression in the slime more than two feet deep, 30 feet long, and 12 feet wide. Four gigantic paws, also deeply impressed, had left at the end of each imprint, and a little to the side, footprints five feet long and two feet wide, with claws being a foot long, with sharp points of which had buried themselves deeply in the mud. There was also the print of a heavy tail, 10 feet long, 16 inches wide at the tip. So they followed the tracks of this thing for five or six miles along the riverbank. And the tracks suddenly stopped. And they, they say that it was almost a, like, a, like by magic. Dupuy heard this and he suggests that they form a hunting party uh, because they couldn't have something like that run around. They're, these guys are looking for gold in the middle of fucking nowhere. So that night, Father Lanou and a local miner named Tom Lemore and five local men from the from the Cleacluck tribe, all joined up to make this hunting party. The next morning, they all set out to the Partridge Creek and even searched a nearby Mc... God, McQuestin River, but they found nothing. So that night, they set up camp on a ridge that overlooked Partridge Creek. And while sitting around the fire, they heard the sound of rocks falling. And it sounded like it was coming from the ravine under them. Before they could react... The sound of an incredible roar blasted through the night, and they grabbed their guns and looked off the ridge uh, over the lake to the ravine opposite their ravine below. Across the creek, they saw a giant gray beast, 50 feet from its nose to its tail, with a short of crest along its back that stood at least 18 feet above the ground. It had a horn like a rhino. Its hide was like a wild boar. It was trying to climb up the opposite ridge across the lake. So the father stated that it had to be a dinosaur, even if it was going as far as to identify it as a cerasaurus. Uh, so they watched it struggle, trying to climb up this ravine for a full 10 minutes. After it gave up on trying to climb the ridge, it ran into the valley on two legs at great speed. 
This scared the dude, the guy so bad that Dupuis and Butler traveled to the commissioner of the Yukon territories and asked for mules, supplies, and 50 men to hunt down this monster. And unfortunately, they became a laughing stock. They thought they were crazy. Newspaper. What, people didn't buy it? Not at all. <laughs> what? Newspaper articles were written about their story, poking fun at them. Uh, but as far as his credibility, uh, fellow writer Jack London tried to hire him as someone to translate his book, The Faith of the Man and Other Stories, into French. And when writing to his publisher, trying to convince him to hire Dupuis, he said, quote, Dupuis is a Frenchman, an artist, a journalist, and the man who knows Alaska better than I do. He has lived the life. I call him an artist. By this, I do not mean painter, but by temperament. Also, in 1908, Dupuis claims to have received a, a letter from Father Renews explaining that he had seen the monster again running across the frozen creek, carrying a deer in its mouth. A full deer? Yeah. Wow. It was serious enough for the local Indian chief and two, his two sons to accompany him in tracking the monster. And they said that it started snowing and the, track, the tracks were soon covered. How convenient. <laughs> so in 1930, the former Hudson Bay Company inspector and writer Philip H. Godsell wrote a bunch of articles, uh, one maybe another older sighting of the beast. He wrote that his friend, one Frank Beaton, uh, the chief factor at Hudson Bay's company, St. John British Columbia Division, he said that he was told by a scientific team that their Cree native guide told him a story told to him by his father. His father had traveled uh, to the south east of the Yukon, where he fell in with a group of Dene Indians. Uh, the men of this time uh, spoke as the De uh, spoke of the Dene as being stone-aged people, old, primitive group of people. But they had told him of a medicine valley that was home to monsters of fearful size and ferocity. They gave him a medicine bag with an image of one of the creatures from the valley burned into the leather of the pouch. He said his dad held it dear and passed it to him, and he showed this to the scientists, and they were shocked to see that it was downright, uh, f in quote, flawless anatomical detail, a two-legged upright walking dinosaur. Damn. So they just came right out and said it. Yeah, they just, uh, much like the people of the Congo, uh, when the, the oldest uh, natives in the area were asked, uh, or, you know, when, when this came up in conversation, yeah, look, yeah, there's those things exist here. That's awesome. Yeah. And to, uh, there's a really, really great YouTube channel. Uh, and I'll put it in the show notes. A really great YouTube channel by an author named Hammerson Peters. And he writes all about Canadian uh, mythology and, and uh, just great stuff. Just an amazing YouTube channel. And he got into, you know, I, I did a bunch of research on this. And just by chance, I said, you know, I wonder if you cut over this. And he had a lot of good information on it. And uh, I, I really like his stuff. It was just so interesting to hear about that medicine bag. I'd actually heard him talk about that medicine bag in a different video when talking about other myths from the people of the area. But uh, the the science the science team were blown away by that. They just it's the last thing they expected to see on this medicine bag. Huh. Well, what what do you think? I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna text you some pictures that were are drawings of the beast from articles now i've got let me see here one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen eighteen nineteen different uh images of article articles and write-ups on this this story and they're not modern they're all old so this story got around everywhere and uh this dude was uh i mean apparently a super credible person so i mean i don't know uh, I don't, I, to me, it was a cool story, but again, when I hear of something like this, uh, uh, in any, in any case, um, we talk about the cool one-offs. I don't, I don't know if this is a one-off. It's weird because it's a dinosaur. Flatwoods is a one-off. It's weird to, to, you know, comprehend that. But when you, when I come across these things, the first thing I ask myself is, does this thing belong here? And when, when I came across a part of the, 
then eight having that medicine bag i was like holy shit it absolutely does I mean, it's to me it's impressive that it's not a, it's not just another tribe of, of of natives that this fella came across it was what they called stone age people the people who would fucking know Oh, those, I just got the pictures. Those are pretty fucking cool pictures. Yeah, I mean, does that, that looks like a, what, like a Uteranus? Like a, I don't know, the hair even makes sense. Yeah, I don't know. I have no idea, but it's fucking cool. Carrying a deer off. That's, you know, that's, I mean, they, they, they're getting these drawings off their description. And uh, you, if, when you see this, if I'll put it in the show notes, this is nothing but a dinosaur. What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> this isn't the Congo. This, yeah, he doesn't belong here. <laughs> no, not that he necessarily belongs in the Congo either. But yeah, it's it's uh, it it almost it makes me kind of believe more in the idea that these are kind of things that like bleed through, like bleed through time. I guess you know, like like it's existing in its time period, but like we're like catching a a little window into its life. 70 million years ago or however long ago it was well then how does that explain like all these cases i mean in the even in the Kasai rex thing this thing was interacting with them yeah because it like comes through the window and then it's it's here interacting and then it just kind of fades back into where it belongs oh so not so much stone tape but almost like physically being there for a moment right right oh, yeah wow okay exactly. yeah that's that's the only thing i can unless we're we're saying that there's actually dinosaurs still romping around and nobody can find them anywhere which i to me seems a little much there had see to me it does seem like a little bit much but with 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 shit like the the rex with the partridge creek monster with mokele and bembe with the titan boa with the boba fofi is that right am i saying that one right i think so yeah boba fofi. yeah i think that's the spider right yeah with all these yeah. prehistorically sized and described, I mean, just dinosaur-like creatures, uh, what do we say to that? I mean, there has to be some places on Earth left still that are so remote that uh, I think maybe not something living that long, maybe a new species, maybe not gigantic like they're talking. There has to be a place that could be a habitat for something like this somewhere on the planet. <laughs> Well, may I mean a habitat is one thing, but you'd have to. There's a lot of things that you'd have to look at because the way that the the biological makeup of animals that existed 65 million years ago, or or you know even earlier than that, um, they're built to breathe in a certain mixture of air that we no longer have on this earth. So it would. In order for, for there to be a population of dinosaurs that still exist, they would also have to have had evolved alongside everything else right. over that period of time to be able to survive our time. A long time to adapt. Yes, yes. So, I mean, that would mean we'd have to have a species of megafauna that, one, we're not even aware of exists, but two... We have no evidence of its evolutionary ancestors beyond the dinosaurs, which just that that doesn't make sense to me. It's so weird. It's weird to have so many uh, legendary beasts from different areas be dinosaurs. And, yeah. and, you know, even even with the Titan boa, like the the photos that that's supposed to be super authentic taken from the Japanese expedition. I mean, they consider that thing found in a way. Yeah, I don't I don't know if I'm willing to to buy into it, but I like to think about it. I think it's really cool. And if you ever called me and said that you're uh turning into a dinosaur and then you say, "Look, scales." I'm going to fucking freak out. Thank you for listening to the Whatcast. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, iTunes and YouTube. Enjoy the podcast. Get yourself a Whatcast t-shirt or a sticker pack. Who was that dude on that one episode? Try the links in Homie's page. All this and more can be found at www.thewhatcasters.com. Thanks again for listening and have a great week.